Hi everyone, welcome to the next lecture. This is the lecture on Plato. Uh, before, let's just recap. We've tried to define knowledge in, like, well, in the lecture series that I called Epistemology Basics. We tried to define knowledge and we said that it's a justified true belief and that one of the hard bits was justification. The Gettier problem seemed to be able to show up justification fairly easily. So we added on a bit that said there had to be no defeaters and we tried to define justification as either internalist or externalist. And then we, when we discussed beliefs, we tried to work out whether or not beliefs were foundational or whether they were coherent. So as I say, whether it was a web or a framework of beliefs that supported that one belief. Let's talk more about truth now. We haven't really discussed truth. In fact, all the rest of the lectures will be on something like truth. Now, Plato had some opinions on truths and beliefs and things. Plato was, oh, gee, let me get this straight, 350 BC, somewhere around there, maybe a bit before that. There were many philosophers before Plato, right? The, the first Greek philosopher gets called Thales. I don't think he's actually Greek. I think he was, he lived what, what we now call Turkey, I think, or maybe Jeru, Israel. But anyway, and, and he was, he said something like, everything is water. Like, he, he was into metaphysics and everything is made of water, he said. Now, Interestingly, we kind of know that everything is made of hydrogen, right? One proton, one neutron, one electron. Hydrogen is two thirds of water. H2O, two out of the three water molecule uh, atoms are hydrogen. So, hey, Thales wasn't too far wrong. I'm sure that was a lucky guess, though, right? Wasn't very justified in coming out, which might have been an accidental two thirds truth. But there are other guys after Thales. You would have heard of uh, Pythagoras. You probably heard of uh, Xenophanes, I think, was one of them. But eventually we arrive at Socrates. Now, you get a whole bunch of people going to tell you, oh, I've read Socrates. I've read, I've read all of Socrates' books. And Socrates never wrote a thing. There's not even any proof that he was literate. Like he was, a, he was an ex-soldier. He was a really big, strong guy. He could hold his booze. And he lived in and around Athens. And he was a very prominent city citizen. And his whole thing that Socrates always said was he was challenging other people that they didn't really know what they meant. So some arrogant person would say, I believe that the good life is X, Y, Z. And Socrates would come over and say, why do you believe that? And keep asking, why, but why, but why, why? And always prove that people didn't know as much as they thought they knew. Now, Socrates had a friend, and he might even be a student, called Plato. Uh, Plato had to watch uh, Socrates die. Socrates was pissed off the, the wrong people, um, some elites in Athens, and was tried allegedly wrongly, like he was accused of a crime that he didn't do, and he was killed for it. And so Plato came after him. Now, to Plato, ethics, the good life, what, what is the good life? Ethics and epistemology are basically inseparable. Because Plato came up with the idea that what the good life is, is knowing, is having as much knowledge as you can. And so practicing epistemology was the same thing as practicing normative ethics. The big thing about Plato, so this is one of these well-worn paths in philosophy. I'm about to say Plato's theories of forms. Plato was a bit of a mystic. He seemed to think that there was another reality out there somewhere in the ethereal world, like something like heaven or the dream time or something like that. And in that place that we could never get to, there existed forms, F-O-R-M-S, forms. And these forms, uh, they existed and... All they are is themselves. So beauty is a form. That's one of the, it's, it's a quality that uh, an object might possess. So beauty is beautiful. The essence of beauty is beauty. So then you have like a, a rose or he, he, Plato's example was Helen of Troy. Helen is what he calls a particular. She's a person. She's complicated. She's got lots of different qualities and traits. And you can never really know Helen because Helen's as a human and she changes and she changes her mind and she grows and matures and she's allowed to evolve. You can't know Helen because she's a particular. There is no knowledge of Helen per se. However, you can know beauty. And Helen partakes of beauty. Helen has beauty. You wouldn't say Helen is beautiful. No, only beauty is beautiful. But Helen partakes of beauty. 
suppose that she really lets herself go, you might say, yeah, Helen does not partake of beauty anymore, but you still always know beauty. And so to Plato, this, another example about Helen, Helen lacked loyalty, right? She left Menelaus for Paris. And so there is a form somewhere in this ethereal world called disloyalty or betrayal or treachery. And we know treachery and then Helen partakes of treachery. Thus, you know a little specific bit about a form that Helen is partaking in. And then by knowing all the qualities of Helen, you eventually, you don't ever know Helen, but you know all these bits of her and you can say that she has beauty, she has treachery and she has fleeing Greece in a boat being chased by a whole army of people, I suppose. So forms of these ethereal mystical things, they don't exist in the real world. To, to the Greeks, Greeks had a funny definition of the word good. Plato thought all forms were good. That is to say that they had virtue. And the actual objects, the particulars on the ground, were the copies of forms, so that the physical world is dependent upon these forms. And the funny thing about Plato is he thought our knowledge of these forms was just innate, that we were born with it, that it was, you know, he really was mystical like that, that our brain somehow, every single mind that ever existed, had all the knowledge of all these forms already there, lying dormant, waiting to see Helen and think, oh, that's beauty. She partakes in it. Forms are pure, but particulars are complex and multifaceted. We can sense particulars, but we know forms. So when I say the word Dog, you know dogginess. Everyone knows dogginess, right? Everyone knows what dogs are. But when I say lassie, you know a black and white border collie called lassie that always gets Timmy out of the well and blah, 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 blah. Lassie's a particular. You don't really know it. Lassie has dogginess. Lassie partakes in intelligence and in bravery and in loyalty and in lovableness. You sense lassie, but you know doggy intelligence, bravery. Uh, what was the other one I said? Loyalty. Anyway, uh, cuteness. Particulars are annoying because they often have two qualities that appear opposites. Like everyone is always saying the thing, speaking of dogs, that you know Hitler was an evil bastard, but he liked dogs as though like he had redeeming qualities. And so it was hard to classify Hitler. We're just saying that you never know Hitler, but you know evil, murderous, genocidal maniac. And those things are all forms. You just know that loving dogs I know is a redeeming feature loving dogs is a redeeming feature I suppose it is forms are very epistemically desirable because they allow us to have definitions definitions of beauty beauty is beautiful how wonderfully simple thank you Plato but particulars are frustrating because we try and define them as so many different forms this is because people can change so this is like Plato's theory of forms is it's very convenient because when we don't have to label uh, Achilles as brave, Achilles can be a coward finally, not that he ever was, but one day he could be a coward and it, we're not trying to label him as perpetually brave. We should say he just partakes in bravery. So let's look at an example of Platonic epistemology in a modern context. John Wayne, for example. John Wayne is a particular masculinity is form john wayne has my masculinity he partakes in masculinity he partook in masculinity his whole life thus he's famous for being a good partaker of masculinity but let us take caitlin jenner for example caitlin jenner is a particular caitlin once had masculinity she once partook in it and she was famous for it because she won a gold medal in the men's event at the decathlete was she a decathlete caitlin now partakes in femininity she was never a man. She is not a woman. She is a particular. But when you try and know Caitlin in the present, you come to know the form femininity. This way of thinking does allow us to tackle the trans issue really well. John Wayne and Caitlin Jenner are both merely particulars and they're partaking in particular forms of masculinity and femininity. Caitlin happened to change the form that she was partaking in. Before we move off Plato, what do you say about Plato? He wrote a lot of books. He had a dialectic. He, his books were always written from the point of view of Socrates. Socrates was like the main character. He was like Harry Potter or something. He was a character in Plato's books, although we do seem to know that Socrates existed in real life. And Plato would always be dialoguing. He would have a dialectic for him and, and someone else. And someone else would be like a young, rash sort of person that thought they knew everything. And Socrates would always prove that they didn't. Plato's famous book was The Republic. 
Plato lived through uh, Socrates' death, a siege, I think, of Athens, in which Athens lost and like a quarter of the population starved to death. And so he wrote the Republic on how to build the perfect city that would always uh, seem to withstand, and would, would be a robust city that and it had a lot of, he was quite totalitarian, the, his ideal of the Republic, it wasn't all that free at all. Uh, but you can imagine for someone that lived through an absolute disaster that maybe he'd see the value in having rules and laws over freedom if it meant that 25% of the population didn't starve to death. Uh, he, the, there's, an, there's Plato's analogy of the cave. Now, I'm going to tell you this one because you really can't talk about Plato. Someone's always going to bring up the analogy of the cave with Plato. So if you're going to go out there and speak, you should know this. The idea of the analogy of the cave is that there's a big long cave with a dead end at one end and it's very dark down here. And there are prisoners who are chained and, and manacled in such a way that they have to stare forward, that they're staring at the back of the wall and they're looking into darkness. And then someone lights a, a fire, like maybe five meters behind them. And then there's a flickering of sort of like shadows and flames on the wall. And then between the backs of their heads and the fire, there are puppets, puppets of trees and houses and animals and people and all the things in the world. And these prisoners stay there for a decade or something, staring always at a darkness with a very smoky flickering of shadows on the walls. And they come to think that these shadows on the walls are everything and they're watching them and looking at them and this is all of their knowledge and then you let one of the prisoners free and they get up stretch their back and then they turn around and they see the puppets by the firelight and they think oh it's just shadows i thought that was real that's not real the puppets are real and then they walk out of the cave and in the bright light they're so like their eyes aren't used to the sun they fall to the ground and they see on the ground the shadows of houses, trees, animals, people, and everything, but this time made by the sun. And they think, oh, this is reality. The shadow of this house is so well formed. I can really see it. But then when their eyes become accustomed to the sunlight, they look up and they see the house itself and they think, oh, this is reality. Now I really see the real thing in the world, the thing of substance, the house. And then eventually you come to know that there are forms in the ethereal world. And so it's this sort of graduation up to knowing. All right, so that's the analogy of the cave. In summary, Plato, really it's only Plato's theory of forms that survives. I mean, he gets quoted a lot. One of the things I think about philosophy is that there's two approaches to it. One is you just flick through books until you find something interesting, remember it, and pull it out at a party as though you're very smart and knowledgeable. I don't like that way, and I don't do that myself. And it annoys me when I meet someone that's read a paragraph that I haven't, and they think they're smarter than me. I mean, anyone can pluck a paragraph. The other way of doing it is to see the progression from the, the dirty, stinky, smelly tribesmen 300,000 years ago, 120,000 years ago to ask the question, where do we come from? And that's the beginning of philosophy and follow its progression through to now and read everything in between and understand, can we get that answer to that question that our ancestor from just thousands of generations asked? In that line, Plato's theory of forms it's way too mystical to take seriously, but it, it plays a part. He plays a part in that he taught Aristotle and that he was a great Athenian. Yeah, I'm not sure how much more of a part Plato plays in it. I'm sure we'll come back to him. But uh, just, just to touch one last thing, I said that I was going to do try and bring in um, the idea of tackling something in a modern context, gender or um, diversity or hypergamy. Honestly, the example about John Wayne and Caitlyn Jenner, I thought illustrated that pretty well. So I'm not going to do that now. So that's Plato. The next uh, presentation is on the great man, Aristotle. All right. So tune in next time and we're going to talk about Aristotle. Bye now.